Thank you, John, and thank you all for coming. I can't imagine a better person to speak to us and to represent the Woodrow Wilson School. I'm, I'm often asked, what is the Woodrow Wilson School about? And I tend to give a mumbling long answer, which somewhere in there has to produce careers of people who make the world a better place in a practical way. And I could really do much better by, say, just have a hand in producing more people like Peter Bell. Uh, Peter has a long and distinguished career, and I'm not going to read his CV, in part because I forgot my glasses, but, uh, all, but he's worked in South America for the Ford Foundation, uh, worked in and out of the U.S. government. Uh, he was president of the Edna McConnell, Clark McConnell Foundation, and most recently has been president of CARE for the past five years. CARE is an absolutely huge organization. It's the largest private relief organization, has programs in more than 60 countries. And I think every day in his work, Peter has to deal with a problem that I suspect we all do when we think about disaster and poverty on a large scale. Uh, and it really raises two questions, at least. Uh, one is, these things aren't just rare events. Uh, I looked at the CARE website, and the disasters of the month are earthquakes in El Salvador and India. And these are huge and terrible events involving hundreds of thousands of people, great loss of life, and so on. But those really are just the disasters of last month. There are many more that constantly happen. And it's clearly very, very important to think systematically about them. And I know from having known Peter that he does. He worries all the time about what are the fundamental and recurring causes of these things, and how can you deal with them systematically? And CARE does too. I noticed that CARE had had programs in India going back 45 years to deal with problems of this kind, and El, Sal and El Salvador for slightly less time. Uh, CARE has an entrenched local network uh, to draw on in times of crisis and also to worry on an everyday basis about how you can make the world better. The other thing that's necessary when thinking about large-scale disaster is to somehow think about it at a human level. It's easy to just feel that there are so many people, so much numbers, that you can forget that there are people involved. And one of the things that no one can fail to know by meeting Peter for any length of time is that he has a great concern for individual people at a per very personal level. When I last visited Peter in Atlanta in, I think, f September 99, CARE was dealing as much of the rest of the world was with problems in Bosnia, Kosovo, et cetera. CARE's 
one of CARE's concern was the fact that Milosevic had captured three CARE workers and was holding them hostage. And Peter had made it a personal concern of his and of CARE's that these people be rescued. Now, in part, this was something that needed to be done because as president of CARE, you have to support your people. And that was important, but it was also clear from talking to Peter how much he cared and communicated that care to everyone in the organization about the individuals involved and the great joy he had when it was announced while I was there, that one of the hostages was released. And the whole organization was excited about it. And it is this kind of concern for individuals and their own fates, as well as a systematic and very smart analytic understanding of how the world works that makes us so lucky to be about to hear Peter talk about affirming dignity and ending poverty, the search for a better world. Thank you so much, Mike, for that kind introduction. Uh, I served for several years as chair of the advisory council to the Woodrow Wilson School and very much enjoyed uh, working with Mike Rothschild and appreciated the candor and the openness and richness of the exchanges that uh, we had back then and have had since. My son Jonathan and my daughter Emily are here with us today. Karen, uh, two weeks before uh, Emily was born, Karen and I chose her name. But in poor communities in Bolivia, parents do not name their children until they've reached the age of one, because so many children die before their first birthday. When Jonathan turned 15, he was concerned about getting his driver's license and beginning preparations for the SATs. But in South Africa today, 15-year-olds face a 50-50 chance of dying from HIV AIDS. Before, earlier this afternoon, I was over in Robertson Hall I brought, bought this can of Coca-Cola. It cost 75 cents. 300 million Africans, half the population of that great continent, live on barely 65 cents a day. The most important challenge of this new century is to end poverty. For some, for some people, this proposition may seem far-fetched, but ending poverty is both morally necessary and actually feasible. All of us must play a role in making it happen. All human beings want and have a right to live in dignity, to determine our own destinies, and to be respected by other by other people. Despite the universality of these rights, our capacities to fulfill them vary enormously. And no dividing line is more profound in influencing the quality of our lives than the gulf between poverty and, pros and prosperity. It is difficult to fathom what extreme poverty means. People in poor communities in developing countries struggle to make a living. They make do without access to adequate food, 
clean water, basic education, decent health care, or protection of the law. They are perched every day on the razor's edge of crises. They reside in the flimsiest housing on the most pre precarious sites, and not surprisingly, are always the hottest hit by natural disasters. They are the most exposed to infectious diseases, such as malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. Because of their complete lack of power, they may be exploited as domestic servants, day laborers, or sex workers. They are shunned and cast into the shadows of society. And they are often punished for their own misfortune. I am deeply moved by the suffering and courage of people in poor communities. But what I find most searing are the lack of choice and opportunity and the stripping away of dignity. It is jarring to travel back and forth between two worlds, a world in which Americans are buying groceries on the internet and a second world in which a ch one child in three in a country like Angola, is dying before the age of five. We must and we can bridge the gap between these two worlds and affirm the ties that bind all human beings to one another. We will not end poverty overnight, but we can make it happen in this century. In my lecture, I will first explain what I mean by ending poverty. I will then share some lessons that could help advance that effort. Next, I will lay out some ideas for transforming the vision of a world without poverty into practical strategies. And finally, I want to talk about your role in ending poverty. Here we are in the year 2001, riding the crest of a wave of extraordinary technological progress. And yet, despite all of this progress, the end of the Cold War, and the process of globalization, almost half the world's population lives on $2 a day or less. All too often, the progress of the world has eluded and even excluded the poor. The very idea of ending poverty is alien to most of us. One generation after another has been raised believing that the poor will always be with us. We know we can alleviate poverty. We know we can relieve suffering. But we have hardly even considered that ending poverty might be realistic. Poverty has meaning in a relative and in an absolute sense. There are certain minimal standards which must always be met for people to live in dignity. These include, for example, access not only to adequate nutrition, clean water, and basic education, but also to basic civil liberties. When I talk about ending poverty, I'm talking first and foremost about all people everywhere at least meeting such minimal or absolute standards. Once having met these standards, each nation must keep raising the bar of what is considered poverty and strive to surpass those standards. We must work toward the vision of a world where all people live in dignity and security, where everyone sleeps in safety and awakens with hope. Most Americans are compassionate toward poor people. But our initial response is often to treat symptoms. We may help the homeless by volunteering in a shelter or a soup kitchen. Although it is important to understand the plight of poor people and to relieve their suffering, we must do more. To end homelessness, we must focus on lasting solutions, like building community mental health systems and expanding the supply of low-cost housing. Otherwise, our good intentions may serve only as band-aids. CARE has learned this lesson, and we continue to learn. We began as a relief agency 
responding with care packages to the threat of famine in Europe after the Second World War. And to this day, we meet people's needs in emergencies, but most of our work is now focused on lasting solutions to poverty. If we are to end poverty, we need to start by taking a more systemic approach, understanding poverty in all its complexity and, under, under, and attacking its underlying causes. The specific causes of poverty vary in the context of each nation, community, and family. But among the most widespread and pernicious causes of poverty are the following. First, poverty is frequently wrapped up in issues of discrimination and exclusion, whether on the basis of gender, race, religion, ethnicity, or caste. Second, poverty is often linked with conflict. In some 36 countries, families are being uprooted from their homes and forced to flee. Women and children are being killed, people go hungry, and diseases run unchecked. Third, poverty is tied to poor governance, to corruption and abuse of power. Governments can trample on the rights of the least powerful members of their society. Fourth, the HIV AIDS pandemic has become both a symptom of poverty and an important cause. More than 90% of the HIV AIDS cases in the world are in developing countries. And finally, poverty is linked with environmental degradation and population growth. Too many people on too little land can be a formula for disaster. The list of underlying causes of poverty is much longer. I cite these examples to convey the complexity of ending poverty. While the task is formidable, it is not impossible. The motivation, the yearning to contribute toward a better world is, is instinctive and deeply human. Most people desire to make a difference for the better, not just in their own lives, but also in the lives of their families, communities, and as far into the world as their horizon may stretch. Transforming this yearning into effective action can be profoundly satisfying. Suppressing it can lead to, lead to a disturbing emptiness. At its best, the privilege of a career in public service is the privilege of dedicating one's life to the search for a better world. My first inclination toward public service was a perverse reaction to the McCarthy hearings. People who had served their country honestly, courageously, and professionally were ruined. In Gloucester, Massachusetts, my hometown, my Sunday school teacher, the librarian, and other people I admired were blacklisted. And decent people, including the city leaders, sat by, incapacitated. I knew then that I wanted to be someone who acted in the face of injustice. While still in high school, I spent a summer on the AFS exchange student, as an exchange student, living with a Japanese family. They had lost relatives with the, in the atom bombing of Nagasaki. Taking me into their home was part of the Okajima's commitment to reconciliation with America. The motto of the AFS, taken from Sanskrit, made a deep impression on me. Walk together, talk together, O ye peoples of the earth, then and only then shall ye have peace. So too did the personal motto of Mrs. Okajima painted on a scroll hanging in an alcove. It read, to make the world more wonderful. In college, a couple of years later, Professor Weiss, Paul Weiss, a professor of metaphysics, who had survived the Holocaust, gave us a command at the end of his final class. I have never forgotten it. Go forth, he instructed, and make the world less miserable. Hardly a day has gone by when I have not found inspiration in the words either of Mrs. Okajima, make the world more wonderful, or of Professor Weiss, 
make the world less miserable. Mrs. Okojima, on my better days, Professor Weiss on my less good days. <laughs> Throughout my career in public service, I have learned many important and sometimes hard lessons. They have sharpened my commitment to making the world better and influenced my thinking about how it can be done. Good intentions must be married with disciplined thinking and effective action, and problems must be considered holistically. These were lessons instilled in me at the Woodrow Wilson School. And when I joined the Ford Foundation, third world development was conventionally viewed as technological, a technological and economic enterprise measured by per capita income. I was one of several Woodrow Wilson alumni who argued that development was more holistic, that it had to do not only with growth but with equity, not only with economics but politics, not only with technology, but culture. Development and human rights are closely interrelated. Development is needed to advance human rights, but human rights must be at the center of development. In 1973, after the military coup of General Pinochet, my colleagues and I transformed the Ford Foundation in Chile from a de development organization into a human rights organization so that we could get eventually back to the work of development. The military junta rewarded our efforts by declaring me a suspicious person. Nevertheless, our principled position helps not only to save lives and careers, but also eventually to recreate space for critical inquiry and public debate. Five years ago, we, we revised CARE's mission statement to put the dignity of each person, which is at the core of human rights, explicitly at the center of our work. That change has triggered subtle but important changes within care, from our responding to people's needs to our upholding the right of each person to a life of dignity and opportunity. Bearing witness and giving voice to poor people through advocacy and reshaping institutions to meet poor people's needs through institutional reform are critical ways to find lasting solutions to poverty. Until the last few years, CARE viewed itself as apolitical, but we now recognize our responsibility to act on what we see in poor communities. Influencing changes in policies and institutions is now part of our mission. We use advocacy to advance people's basic rights and to get at underlying causes of poverty. In Sudan, for example, during a horrible famine several years ago, CARE's work was saving the lives of tens of thousands of people. But we realized that cycles of famine would never end until there is a just settlement to Sudan's civil war. Since then, CARE has become a leading advocate for a just peace in Sudan. Ending poverty begins with helping people to help themselves, while building on their strengths, not focusing on their weaknesses. By definition, poor people have very few tangible assets. But when given the chance, they are strongly motivated to improve their lives. And an effective starting point can be organizing themselves for cooperative efforts. Through their own organizations, poor people can learn from one another, set community priorities, tackle projects themselves, and press authorities for support. At the Inter-American Foundation, we subscribe to that, mo that credo. But I came to the realization, painfully, that not everyone agreed with us. The heritage Foundation issued a report on our work stating, it is well and good to involve poor people in development, but wrong to let them be in charge. Shortly thereafter, the presidentially appointed board asked me to step down. In the uproar that followed, however, the foundation reaffirmed its commitment to empowering poor people to control their own lives. I have worked with people who have, 
who have led extraordinary changes in difficult settings. Such people may initially be discounted as crazy or rejected as dangerous. In developing countries with authoritarian regimes, these people can put their very lives at risk by upsetting the established order. In 1969, for example, when a young Brazilian professor of sociology was ousted from the University of Sao Paulo by the military regime, he decided to break with tradition and remain in Brazil. Rather than go into exile, he proposed starting a freestanding center for social research. And I recommended a startup grant to the Ford Foundation. Despite warnings from the US Embassy about the professor being a leftist and threats about my grant recommendation being bad for my career, Ford approved our going ahead. And despite harassment from the Brazilian secret police, the professor built the center into a premier research institution. He went on to play a leading role in the democratic resurgence of the country. And today, my old friend, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, is serving his second term as president of Brazil. When I look back over my career, I admit to being as idealistic and hopeful, indeed more resiliently so, as when I first came to the Woodrow Wilson School. Way back then, I acquired what Albert Hirschman has called a bias for hope. Poverty can be ended. The task will be formidable, but I know that we must do it and that we have the means to accomplish it. I have read some of the scenarios of doom, the pessimistic predictions, especially for Africa, and I appreciate the complexity in ending poverty. Our first test in rising to the challenge must be to reject the scenarios of doom as morally reprehensible and articulate a vision that will galvanize skeptics into action. There are three basic reasons why I believe poverty can be ended in this century. First, we already have examples of countries that have made remarkable progress over recent decades. 50 years ago, who would have predicted the incredible progress of the East Asian countries? The 1997 financial crisis aside, these countries have made significant, speedy, and sustainable advances in both growing their economies and in combining growth with equity. The case of China is also quite remarkable. Over the past two decades, the economy has grown at a rate of 7.7% annually doubling each decade. And if it maintains that rate for a third decade, the Chinese economy will have grown eightfold in a single generation. My second reason for believing that poverty can be ended